Good morning, everyone. Um, today is going to be the sixth and final lecture for the NDE module. The topic of today's lecture will be specialty NDE and inspections, um, application specific, and includes various types of materials, metallic and non-metallic. Um, just uh, a couple brief words regarding the draft proposals and the paper. I've emailed, um, if you've submitted your half-page proposal, I've emailed uh, everyone back individually. So if you haven't received an email from me, um, you should have. If, if um, I've asked you to either refine or make the topic of the paper more, uh, less, less, uh, more focused, make sure that you email me back um, rather than just go ahead and write the paper. Um, if I've asked you to, to get back to me with additional information, uh, make sure you take care of that. Uh, in terms of deadlines, November 1st is the deadline for the draft 10-page paper. Um, then I will send out peer review groups of three or four people who will review the papers. Um, you'll have about three weeks to make comments to your, your group mates' papers. And then that will be due on um, after Thanksgiving, November 25th. And the final paper, incorporating the comments or um, if you disagree with your peer, peer group's comments, um, that will be due December 6, and that's what you'll get your final grade based on. So just a follow-up from the ultrasonic inspection. We had discussed um, how you can select various um, probes and arrays. So one of the things I did want to touch on here is that um, this is a commercial software available. Um, uh, the company is Olympus. They're actually based in Waltham, Massachusetts here. But one of the things you can see here is it's what's known as a focal law calculator. So if you um, input the specific material, whether it's a steel, aluminum, it already takes into account the speed of sound and the acoustics for the material that you're dealing with. But what the software allows you to do is you can actually um, specify how many arrays you want to be pulsed at a single time. And it allows you to basically cater the inspection to the sample under inspection and also to the, the wedges and probes that you select. Um, so the, that's known as the firing sequence for the ultrasonic phased array pulse. Um, we discussed various materials, so I, I believe you had asked about composite materials. So this is an example of a composite T-joint, and one of the issues, if it's for aerospace, you can get delamination or other, delamination for aerospace with carbon fiber reinforced polymers um, is known in the industry. Um, they've actually had to ground entire fleets of planes about seven, eight years ago due to delamination defect. So what you're seeing here is a composite T-joint. A known flaw was up here up near the top of the T area. And one of the things that the image is pointing to is you have to actually know what you're looking at in terms of uh, being an inspector because you're getting other artifacts in the image. These can be ghost artifacts, but they can also be due to the taper when the geometry changes. So you're seeing in the C-scan um, artifacts due to that geometry at that tapered curve, but then you're also seeing uh, what, where the flaw is right here. So this is where setting the gate and threshold, the decibel drop levels are critical for the specific material that's under inspection. Um, so for today, I wanted to discuss specialty NDE. Um, as opposed to the in methods that we talked about earlier that are pretty ubiquitous, um, so visual exams, eddy currents, sometimes they're specialized for if it's a magnetic particle or not, but those are generally uh, the most observed techniques in the industry. These will be more specialized techniques and they'll be more application specific that we're discussing today. So in particular, in certain sites, whether it's something that's going out into space or it's at a nuclear power plant, the access to the location that you need to inspect dictates 
whether you'll be able to use certain techniques or not. In addition, um, there's some considerations where there's dissimilar materials that you're trying to join, fasten, or in some other way, uh, assemble as part of a larger structure. So that can include carbon fiber polymers, it can include high, dense, high density polyethylenes, um, it, glass, other types of materials. We discuss curtain wall applications, um, and there'll be some slides later on where we discuss that. So the, uh, and, and finally, sometimes the application dictates what type of technique you can use or not use. So whether it's a liquid natural gas tanker, whether it's pipeline oil gas type work, um, or is something as simple as uh, if there's interaction with the human body. So if, if you go to the airport and you fly, you go through, now they've incorporated at most airports millimeter wave ND technology. There's um, threshold level set for the interaction of that dose with the human body and what, what's the allowables in terms of the x-ray voltage and, and this all ties into application specific NDE. Um, the techniques we're gonna discuss today include um, just a discussion on infrared thermography. The, I had brought in um, a FLIR, which is forward-looking infrared radar. Um, we had passed that equipment around earlier. Uh, additional techniques that we're going to discuss today include LIDAR, which is light detection radar, digital image correlation, um, ATOS, which is advanced topometric optical sensing, and that is used oftentimes for large structural components um, in particular for reverse engineering of structural components. And then the last um, technology is referred to as GASP, Gray's Angle Surface Profilometers, uh, and those are specific to glass. So for float glass manufactured components, whether it be these windows that are there we're looking at here, or if there's other type of architectural um, or structural designs where glass is incorporated. So LIDAR, um, if you're not familiar, AASHTO is uh, an organization in the USA that uh, provides information on the infrastructure of bridges uh, in the country. So AASHTO has, uh, on average, given bridges uh, in the US a, a D rating. Um, a lot of the bridges are over 30 years in service, and uh, there's not enough uh, engineers, architects to repair the, the degradation at, at any single time. So there's other techniques that are being used non-destructively to attempt to accelerate the pace at which one can inspect either the uh, surface, which would be an asphalt or concrete type surface, or it can be the decking, which is subsurface, and in particular, on bridges, uh, the, there's concern with corrosion of decking over time, um, and that leads in some cases to having bridges being closed to pedestrian traffic and auto traffic. Um, what you're seeing here on this image here is when you have to actually go onto the bridge and an and individual has to inspect it, they would have to at least close one lane off. Typically, these types of inspections are done at night where you have a bucket truck or some hydraulic type truck that uh, goes over the edge of the bridge and has uh, actual human doing inspections, whether they're ultrasonic thickness checks or mag particle on uh, fastened components or things like that. So there's a, a cost associated with closing that lane down to pedestrian traffic or auto traffic and there's also a cost with uh, staging, actually getting the equipment on site and off site. So one of the techniques they're using is LIDAR and, and what they typically do uh, in the last five to 10 years, you're seeing it more often, is they're using UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, rather than having um, to bring this heavy equipment onto the bridge or other overpass, they will use UAVs 
and they'll use it as a screening procedure. And then if they see degradation that they believe they'll have to follow up with a, a human inspector, it's, it saves them a lot of time when they know the areas they need to go check out. The image up here, um, if you're not familiar, this is Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. This is after the fire damage. And there'll be some slides where I discuss that um, later on. So one of the one of the things I wanted to show here is this is a UAV drone um, performing a bridge inspection underneath the decking. So what is happening? You'll see that that exterior geodesic dome. That is so the, the lenses on the camera don't actually hit the decking and scratch it. Um, but you're actually, they're actually able to get in these hard to, hard to access areas on the bridge um, and just perform. This is the, there'll be a, an individual controlling the UAV. This is the latest and greatest in visual examinations um, for hard to access areas. So it's not just for bridges. But uh, this was a good example, I thought, where you can see these are connection points, welds. Um, so the, this would be going underneath the deck and going in cross beams. Doing this type of inspection it will save a lot of time rather than having to put an inspector on that bridge. One of the concerns with performing that type of inspection, however, is that it is only applicable to surface cracks. So, and in, and in general, this is related to inspection of concrete, thick concrete structures. So if there is a weld defect on the underside, whether it's a, a butt weld or other type of joint connection, if there was a lack of fusion or other type of welding flaw, this technique would not be appropriate to see that crack. There's also limits of detection with respect to um, whether the crack started to propagate or not. But in terms of um, the accelerating the speed at which you can now look at these bridges, it is much faster than having to bring heavy equipment onto the site, close down areas of the structure, and have a manual person do the inspection. So. Um, it's, you know, for steel and both rebar, um, as I said, one of the issues that you can, you can get false positives with this technique, and in particular with issues related to corrosion. So one form of corrosion is known as exfoliation, and if you go over bridges or you go over rail, trestle bridges, overpasses, you'll see that, that uh, you know, rusty appearance on the exterior. And what happens is, the rule of thumb is it takes about 10 inches of rust flaking to equal one inch of actual base metal loss. So you can actually get exfoliation buildup of the rust. And if the LIDAR technique is only from the exterior surface, it can appear that there's not that extent of rust loss when you would really need to have an individual go in and do that inspection. So with the LiDAR, do they actually build up like a 3D model of the bridge and then every time they test it, they like compare those two models or is it just like a dude there that's just looking at it and is like, oh, that's got a crack that does So the, in terms of the, on the drone, there's an individual flying the UAV. Uh, the question was, do they build up a 3D model um, or is there just an individual with the electronics and flying the drone? So they would usually do... Um, strain gauging on that bridge in addition to the UAV. So the strain gauging will give you uh, information with respect to the loading conditions, whether there's any type of bending or warping versus um, if there's 18 wheelers flying over that bridge, a strain gauge or um, LVDT, linear, linear variable displacement transducer. That will give you information on the actual um, loading conditions at the sh on the structure. What they can then do is um, you can use 3D laser techniques that scan large areas, and you can build a 3D model using that. But the UAV is really focused on 
the area that those lenses can. Yeah, it's it's a it's a high tech vis, visual exam is basically what it is. Um, as I had said, so this is Notre Dame Cathedral. This is about two months after they had the fire damage, and one of the issues is. On large structures like this, after there's been a catastrophic accident, there is takes a lot of time to put the scaffolding and staging in place so that an individual can get up and actually see the extent of damage up in the spires and other areas. So using uh, LIDAR or, or as simply using a drone to do the visual, it doesn't even need to be a drone with LIDAR attached to it, it can simply be a drone with lenses. To, to do the visual, can save a lot of time. Um, but the issue with the drones is areas where you see the wood blocking and things like that, you need to have an individual go and look because there can be uh, issues, especially whether it's mason, masonry work or if it's refractories, if the fire gets to a certain temperature, you can get softening, yielding of that. If, in this case, there, you don't really have to worry about rebar, but if it was a bridge or another type of structure, there could be issues if the temperature of the fire reaches a certain point, it can be a structural issue with respect to the reinforcing bars uh, or other metallic components involved. Here though, you can actually see there, there is heat damage from the fire at arches. So the design of these cathedrals the arches are, are important structural components for load carrying members. So if there's heat, heat issues or thermal um, degradation, you still need to have an individual come up here and put their eyes on it. But the drone can assist in speeding up areas where they would go. It, it helps to prioritize areas for the inspection. Digital image correlation. It's um, photogrammetry technique. So it relies on two high-speed cameras. And when we say high-speed cameras, these are thousands of frames per second that it's capturing the data. And what happens with this technique is you actually use uh, either a spray can or you, uh, you actually want to get a random pattern. Um, so the globules from a, a spray paint can are typically what's used if it's uh, if the surface finish is not important. And they, they use this, they call it a speckle pattern, so that in 3D space, what happens is if, if they perform a test and it's under loading, they can track using GPS and, and the two cameras specific features of the, the spherical globules from the paint. So that is actually how they track over time with the cameras whether uh, a structural component is uh, expanding due to freeze thaw in, in, in specific, that's, spe that's specific to concrete, but it can also be used for metallic components as well. And what it enables is they then use the software and tie in the speckle patterns and the loading conditions to generate what's known as virtual stress strain curves. So what you're seeing here is, this is one of the commercial vendors of this type of equipment. And these are the two high-speed cameras on either side. So they're the, using, using GPS techniques, you're able to do um, basically triangulation of the component under test. And as the grips expand and you get your you know, ductal uh, cup cone type fracture here, the stress strain curve is generated by the movement of the speckle pattern. So you can do it. One of the issues that is important with this type of test, however, is if you have um, a metallic component and it's lustrous, you can, you can actually drop images as the component expands, right? So as there's elongation, you'll, you'll see base metal. It won't be that speckle pattern anymore. And, and there's a problem, or not problem, but that is one of the constraints of the photogrammetry software because that lustrous, shiny appearance reflects through the cameras and it results in uh, what areas in the image that would be dropped 
pixels, essentially. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, stress strain curve. And what it's reading is micro strain values. As the test is, as it's under test, it's reading micro strain. Um, they've actually performed benchmarking val validation. So you, if they know this is a three or five percent yielded, you know, sample, they can then compare that against the values in the software. So this is becoming uh, used more often in industry. Um, an example I'll give you. Uh, at a nuclear power plant in the US, they were performing what's known as a structural integrity test. And what happens there is they actually pressurize the primary containment to see the quality of the concrete. So the concrete, once it gets beyond 40 years, nuclear power plants have to go to NRC, which is Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they have to show to the NRC that there's been no degradation in either the primary containment or in the formwork rebar that makes up the containment. So they have used this technique under pressure for nuclear power plants to, and it, and I'll actually, if you want, I can post the papers online, but if you, if you look at the um, dog tail, the yellow dog tailed paper, it actually has the images and it shows what's known as cold joints in the containment structure. So as they do concrete pours over time in the containment structure, you can't pour it all at once. You have to pour a certain thickness and then let it reach over 90% compressive strength before you continue pouring. So those cold joints are areas where they want to go in and make sure that there hasn't been spallation or other type of mechanical degradation of the concrete. So this technique was actually used at a commercially operating plant to show the quality of the concrete and that plant had been operating over 40 years. So the next example is um, for the digital image correlation is related to uh, military um, soldiers' helmets, whether they're made of Kevlar or other type of composite material. There's been studies on ballistic impacts. So if um, there's a soldier in the field and he actually gets a headshot with his helmet on, they've used this digital image correlation to actually estimate for trauma purposes how much impact blunt force trauma on a soldier's head goes through the helmet and gets transferred to the soldier's brain. So there's been a lot of studies through Army Research Lab down in, um, down in Maryland and then other labs as well. So this is from uh, a published journal article. What you're seeing here is the time lapse of the ballistic impact to the Kev Kevlar helmet. And then what they've generated using the digital image correlation is over time, the point loading uh, resulting in the blunt force trauma of a, what would be a person who receives that um, force. So the tests they do, they do downrange and then they use, if you remember the crash test dummy commercials from back in the day, they use basically like a crash test dummy and put the helmet on and they can see how much force and they can see the difference in force depending on the caliber ballistic that's used. So it's um, pretty interesting research that's been performed. That's, that is over um, about 5,000 frames per second. You can track the bullet impact. Um, and you can actually see that the military soldiers' helmets uh, become so robust that rather than penetrating through the helmet, it actually um, ricochets off the helmet. So it absorbs the energy from the ballistic and then it ricochets back rather than going through. Well, the results show the, they, they're able to quantify the extent of force. Um, and there's debates on whether 
it's better to survive the headshot and have the blunt force trauma or not. There actually is debates in military circles on whether one is better than the other. But the technology for the helmets has advanced to the point where they can actually stop the bullet from penetrating the helmet. But the energy, the force of impact is then transferred through to the skull. So that's, I, I can post these papers and you can read the results and follow it up yourself. But um, there is interesting research going on. Um, at one of the focuses, uh, at least for the US military, is um, to whether it's the Navy, they called it littoral combat ships, or whether it's the Army, it's the goal that um, they have a war with the loss of no uh, civilian or soldier life. So, I mean, you can still you can stop the bullet, the bullet, but you will never stop the shock wave that is produced. Uh, yeah, the that's impact. and that's that's what you were seeing. Yeah. Uh, the progression of that uh, back wall shock wave, or it's the it's the dissipation of that bullets that ballistics energy. So the the it has to get dissipated somewhere, and if it doesn't go through, if the bullet doesn't go through the helmet, then they, the, there is blunt force trauma after that. Yeah, that's why they used to use sand in the beds, uh, so that the weight is dissipated, but you cannot put uh, too much weight on the helmet, otherwise. A person has to, yeah. So that this is where the trade-offs come into play. You want to have flexibility and um, lightweight, but you also want to have high impact resistance. The next technique um, is the uh, ATOS system, which is um, basically, it is a multi-axis scanner and it generates up to 1.3 million data points um, per component. So what you're seeing in this upper image here is point cloud data for a disk, compo disk component for aerospace. And these disks, this is where the blades, this is the dovetail attachments where the blades attach to the disk. And you can see your uh, profile view as well as top down view here. But one of the um, main uses for the ATOS system is because it generates such a fine mesh that it can then be imported into CAD software and they use it for reverse engineering purposes. So if one original equipment manufacturer um, is certified from the FAA and a competitor wants to figure out how they did their geometry or how they designed the component, they can typically use the ATOS because it, it, it gives you so many data points and the rendered image, you can get down to um, less than 0 0.002 inch uh, resolution. So that, that 0 0.002 inch resolution is typically um, the number I've seen in literature with respect to aerospace tolerances. That would be the tolerance uh, of this dovetail connection. So we're talking mills tolerance. Um, so for macro scale com structural components, there's value um, if you're trying to see what uh, a competitor, a manufacturing company is doing. And the other thing is that it can perform the scans uh, relatively quickly as opposed to x-rays where it would take hours and you'd have to leave the component overnight to have the uh, computer tomography performed. This can, this, re this can do minutes to hours rather than overnight. So there is a time savings involved. So the next technique is specific to float glass, architectural glass components, and it's known as a grazing angle surface polarimeter. And the point of this technique is that it measures the residual surface stress, um, and it measures the stress on the tin side of the uh, float glass. So if you're familiar with the float glass process, you have the glass and it floats over a bed of tin typically. So this technique um, actually looks on the tin side. So if, if you're familiar with glass manufacturing, 
there is a tinned side of the glass and there's the non-tinned side of the glass. So this technique, um, it basically uses the fact that for float glass, you know there's a residual compressive stress layer and it uses piezo, electron, uh, piezo transducers and it uses the Snell's law essentially. You know nigh snigh ner snur for particular glass and in this case it's sodalon glass. You'll get a diffraction type pattern and based on that diffraction pattern they tune the equipment in to no, you know, known thickness and then they can get residual stresses. So I have a video from one of the vendors um, that, that manufactures this technique and what you'll see here is this is only for surface stress measurement. So if there was um, inclusions in the glass, it's not applicable. Uh, one of the inclusion types is known as a nickel sulfide inclusion. But this is for surface residual stress layers. So if there is impact, say there was a hailstorm, uh, you know, or some type of wind loading and you're in Chicago or on a skyscraper, you can go up on, you know, you can go up to the areas um, and see if the, the panes or plies of the glass are still satisfactory or not. Um, the one example, I gave an example of a bridge in China where they, they made, they manufactured the bridge out of glass and then they actually, the first couple weeks it was open, they had a woman walk on the glass with high heels and uh, she actually went through one of, they, they're called triple IGUs, so that's, there's three panes, so you have redundancy, so if one fractures, you don't actually fall through. But they, they didn't think of the point loading from the, from the heel itself, and it fractured one of those panes, and then what happens is you have to take into account how do you repair that when it's over a, uh, an overpass that's thousands of feet in the air. So I believe that the bridge was closed for a month or two while they were repairing it. And then the solution was, I don't think they let people on with high heels anymore. And not only that, they have to wear like uh, scrubs, like when you're in the hospital. So, so the, the soles of your feet aren't in direct contact with that glass. Um, another example would be, um, in Chicago, they have, uh, I believe it's called The Ledge, which is uh, either Chrysler Building or one of their high rises. And you can actually go up and they have an area where it's all made of glass and you can go and look down to ground level. So they can use these gasps to see if um, there's any type of loss in that residual compressive layer. So it can be used as preventative maintenance. One of the um, limitations that I did want to point out is uh, they're using glass uh, manufacturing and architectural purposes and they're really pushing the limits these days. So I've seen they actually use chemical etching on the glass to put uh, a surface feature. So whether you wanted your sports team's imprint or logo on the glass, they can now do that manufacturing purposes, but that would interfere with the output from that gas component. The other issue um, would be uh, if it's curved glass. So there's, in Europe, they're actually designed buildings with curved glass. So the gasp is good for flat panel, uh, and that's why they can use it on certain automotive components. When there's curvature to that, the glass, you have to be careful that you don't get false positive indications. And all you're seeing in, in this image here is just a schematic of um, how the surface uh, residual compressive layer in float glass um, is, is imparted into that, into that float glass. The next technique is specific for power transformers, whether it's for nuclear power um, or coal, um, uh, other types of uh, power components. <clears throat> and it's called swept frequency response analysis. 
So one of the issues is power transformers are critical to the electric grid. Um, and if you have a power transformer go, you can then no longer take the power being generated from either the nuclear plant or the coal plant or the cogen plant, whatever type of energy site it is. If the power transformer goes, you can no longer take that energy and distri distribute it through the grid. So they use swept frequency response analysis to check the integrity of the windings, um, whether they're high voltage, low voltage windings, um, to make sure that they either haven't uh, had movement door while in service, or to make sure that there um, hasn't been degradation due to the aging of the transformers themselves. Um, as opposed to mechanical stressors, the term is electrical stressors. So if you have um, unplanned shutdown of a, a nuclear plant, it will be an electrical stressor because you have to, you have to basically um, take the plant down faster than you typically would want to. So the, the starting and stopping of these types of components in and of themselves can lead to degradation over time. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the materials involved in the entire assembly of the power transformer, there's no single material. So you have copper windings, you have a silicon steel core typically, um, and then the insulating paper is typically like a craft type paper. Um, this is to make sure that you don't have the uh, electromag, you don't lose that designed electromagnetic um, architecture. The, the windings themselves are designed to have a specific uh, electro, electro and magnetic response. And the other issue is that they're typically in a hermetically sealed environment under mineral oil. So the mineral oil itself can degrade over time. You can get what's known as dissolved gas in the mineral oil due to the operation of the component. So here's a schematic of a power transformer. Um, these are the cooling systems, but what we're concerned with here are the windings. And you have both high voltage windings and low voltage windings. The design of the transformers is specific to whether it's a 500 kilovolt, 300 kilovolt. It's specific to the power output at the site. Um, up here, these are known as bushings. So it, the design of the transformer relates to how they insulate um, and how they basically take the transformer and take it from the generating site to the grid. And um, what you see here, these iron cores, this is the silicon steel. Um, so this is a schematic on uh, just a general construction components. Using that swept frequency response analysis, what you would see here is this is internal. This is what the windings would look like. This is the craft paper insulation material right here. And what can happen is that the, these can shift. There can either be shifting due to um, abnormal electrical responses, or it can sh be shifting due to some other type of uh, environmental uh, off design condition. So they use this technique to make sure that there's been no movement of the components because slight movement of the components with respect to one another can change the magnetic uh, flow lines and it can ultimately cause a catastrophic failure prematurely. Um, the, how it works is it utilizes the low voltage signal they vary the frequency that they apply, and what they end up getting is a um, ratio of input to output signals called the transfer function specific to that winding that's under test. Um, this is typically used in conjunction with other uh, non-destructive techniques, and they include thermal, monitor, thermal monitoring, partial discharge testing, as well as what's known as DGA, dissolved gas analysis, and that's for the mineral oil, whether there has been um, uh, acetylene, methane, they, they're specific 
uh, gaseous components that can be dissolved into the mineral oil over time. And these can lead to premature degradation of the cellulosic paper. So these things, when you flick the lights on in your house, you generally don't think of this. But um, if, you, if a power transformer goes in your neighborhood, the, the lights go out uh, if they don't have an auxiliary power in place. So this is very important to the reliability of the electric grid. Um, and these are some of the techniques that are typically used. So one of the, the last one I wanted to show you was with respect to concrete structures, another um, option for using drones is if you wanted to do an inspection up here on these cooling towers, rather than having an individual actually climb up there and, and look at the, the cooling tower, they can have drones go up here and do a general screening process um, and then determine if they need to actually have an individual go in. But one of the things I just wanted to show here is they're actually, um, some countries, Germany's going away from nuclear power. Um, there's other countries that are investing more in nuclear power. But one of the things that's new, whether you've seen it in the news or not, is how they actually demolish these. So this is just a quick little video on their imploding the cooling towers now. And they've actually done computer simulation models on where they actually put the thermal charges to cause the implosion to happen um, without, uh, as safely as possible, I guess is the way to put it. So you, you see this go down in a matter of seconds. That is, that is um, three, uh, you know, uh, on uh, order of magnitude, that's over three feet, three feet thick, one meter thick concrete. Um, so you need, this is where you take into account um, the size scale. So if, if you didn't use that, the LiDAR or the, or the UAV drone, uh, if you wanted to actually penetrate from the outer surface to the inner surface, you're almost limited to either uh, ultrasonic technique or a high um, X-ray, gamma ray type technique, just because you will not penetrate through that concrete if you use other electromagnetic techniques. So along the lines of the cooling tower, uh, other concrete structures in nuclear power plant the issue that you have to deal with is that there's radiation involved and there is a radioactive dose. So in certain areas, a human can't go in just because it's not safe. It's restricted by the dose that an individual is allowed to receive. Um, if you've ever had a dosimeter, if you've ever been at a site where they give you a dosimeter, you can only get a certain amount of dose in one year and then you, cannot then you can't get any more. So some of the things that they're actually looking into are, uh, if you saw on the news, they released the cheetah robot. So using either robots to go in um, to do these types of inspections where the dose is not an issue, or to use drones or non-human uh, techniques to do the inspections. But one of the issues uh, specific for nuclear power plants is access. So if you want to see the uh, inner diameter of a reactor pressure vessel, you have multiple feet worth of concrete on the exterior. And you're limited by that access to, you can't chip that concrete out and look through it. So you have to use a technique that you know will penetrate through not only the concrete, but then through the uh, 10 to 13 inches of metal that makes up the reactor pressure vessel. So you have attenuation of the signal at the interface, and then you have issues with both the environment because it's at a high temperature. This is a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit, and it's also at a radi radiation uh, dose, uh, a hot environment, they, it's known as in the industry. So nuclear inspections is particularly uh, difficult 
Um, Fukushima, a lot of uh, issues getting into where the, the core melted down. It took them four years to develop a robot that they could actually put under the water and get a visual set of eyes on the melted core. So um, this is if you're into robotics or mechanical type engineering, this is where the materials ties in with the optics, ties in with the robotics. And there's a lot of um, promise in the industry for new techniques non-destructively coming uh, out, out of, basically after there's been a, a failure, they need to be able to go in and inspect it afterwards. So the question I wanna leave with the people watching on the video and the people here is, the non-destructive industries basically changed over the last 30 years due to computing power and using the ability to get color images and 3D scans. Um, it's really changed the industry, industry versus the simple point scans and strip charts that were used um, you know, for probably 50 to 80 years prior. Okay, you, are, you have the ability using it in a digital way to store the data so that if you go in, in a nuclear plant, they, if it's called a breaker to breaker run, it operates two years without shutting down. And then in two weeks, they do their inspections. So um, you can go from breaker to breaker run and then look at it again. And if you have that digital output from the data, you can get a more precise comparison on the me mechanical integrity, as well as in some cases, the electrical integrity of these components. Um, the question I'll leave to you is, you guys seen on the news, all right, things get hacked into, election voting machines, things like that. Um, what would be the implications if there was a black hat hacker or some type of nefarious individual, and this is a life critical structural component, if they can go in and corrupt that output of the data to say, leave that bridge in service another two years, when in reality, the data would show to take it out of service. So this is an ethical consideration. Um, for any of you who end up wanting to become professional engineers, what you typically would have to do is pass the EIT engineer and training um, test first. Um, this is, it's also known as the FE fundamentals of uh, engineering exam. So state by state they have requirements where you actually have to consider the ethics involved in the engineering industry so it's not just the ethics of signing off on a report if you don't have the the data to prove support your point it would also tie into what are the ethics of um, somebody who has the computing skills that they can go alter this data so that's not necessarily a professional engineer. I don't know if they have a ro professional robotics engineer or a professional computing engineer, but with a MIT, we're gonna be building this new college of computing. It's an ethical consideration because it ties into the materials, the mechanics, um, and these are life critical structures. So the last video I wanted to show you related to ultrasonics is this video here, and this is, um, this will show you um, the, what would be known as the wave front. So as, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, how they pulse the different channels, what you can see here is upon pulsing of the channels, this is your wave front coming in. This would be, uh, you know, this could be a flaw in the material, and this would be how that wave front reverberates back. So whether it's a pulse echo technique, whether it's a back wall or time of flight, there's multiple ultrasonic ways that um, you can then both determine whether there is a flaw present or if you want to attempt to try to size the flaw. So with that, I thank you. And um, if you have questions, email me. Thank you.